Hi, I'm Jennifer Simmons with AIM. Welcome to the second week of the 2021 legislative session. We're here this week with our legislative team to give you a quick recap of what's been happening this week. Um, we've got Matt Greller, our CEO, Lindsay Moss, our Chief Government Affairs Officer, Jenna Nepper, our Government Affairs Manager, and Campbell Ritchie, our Policy Director. Thanks, guys. Um, Matt, let's jump right in and talk about an issue that we keep thinking is behind us, but it keeps rearing its ugly head every session or two, and that's the business personal property tax. Um, you want to give a little history and then talk about what's going on this session? Sure. Thanks, Jennifer. We just came out of a legislative committee meeting. A couple hours were spent with the committee. Just wanted to thank them for their work. It was very uh, insightful, very valuable. I uh, appreciate the time they're putting in. But business personal property for the, the veterans tuning in this week, you'll remember a couple of years ago when Governor Pence was in office and the legislature looked a little bit different. We had a major uh, business personal property tax proposal before us, the removal of the business personal property tax in various forms. And we had a, a successful campaign that we dubbed, you know, replace, don't erase that saying that the legislature needed to uh, replace any revenue lost to local government that perhaps we could agree that business personal property tax is somewhat antiquated and maybe it does provide a competitive disadvantage for manufacturers and others uh, but at the same time it's a massive piece of the revenue pie for local government uh, and that it just absolutely has to be replaced it can't uh, we can't move forward without without that level of, of funding uh, and the discussion is come back in various forms the last couple of years, usually very, very small items, uh, looking at a, a variety of issues. Uh, but now there's a, a pretty significant bill, uh, Senate Bill 3, 336, uh, that has been scheduled for a hearing next week uh, that will be uh, looking at it in a, a more macro way. I do suspect that it'll be pared down, at least I hope it will be pared down some, uh, if not completely. Uh, but it's certainly an issue that looks like it's here to stay, something that we will have to uh, address in a meaningful way in, in the coming years and coming sessions. Uh, Campbell, I think, you know, has been following it most closely and, and has a good look at exactly what uh, 336 contains. Yeah, so basically there, there are three parts of it. The first part is to uh, expand how they calculate the per business personal property tax exemption. So currently, if you're a small business uh, under, if you have less than uh, 40,000 in business per personal property, you're exempted from the tax and they want to expand that so that when you're calculating whether you have less than 40,000, you include your depreciation. Um, and so that they estimate that about 52,000 uh, more businesses will qualify if that goes through resulting in loss of uh, 12 million. And that's basically the provision the Senate passed last year that ended up not passing in the House. This version also includes a much more significant change, which uh, currently when you're assessing the, uh, the value of the business personal property, it includes depreciation, but you can only depreciate down to uh, 30%. So you never, you, it's never depreciated more than uh, 70%. So you always are taxing at least 30% of every asset that they own. Um, this bill would eliminate that 30% floor for new uh, equipment that's acquired as of uh, next fiscal year. So over time, that can build up to a very large fiscal impact. They estimate uh, up to $15 billion of AV would be lost, resulting in uh, annual revenue losses of like $175 million. So that's very significant. The third part also uh, blows out depreciation uh, floor on the largest uh, investments that industrial uh, consumers make. So that would also have a, an impact included in that depreciation loss. So it's a, it's a fairly significant bill, more significant than in years past in terms of its fiscal impact that they're proposing. So I think it's safe to say we'll be keeping a really close eye on that. We'll be engaging heavily and, and watch your emails um, next week for any updates on that bill. Um, on the good news front, um, during the pandemic, I think it's pretty safe to say that local governments have been able to continue operating in large part because of electronic meetings or virtual meetings, um, being able to host their 
important uh, board meetings and council meetings on Zoom, just like we are right now. Um, they're beholden though at this point to executive orders allowing them to do that. Um, Jenna, do you wanna talk about our initiative to allow this going forward to make it easier to engage with municipal government? Yeah, we've been um, working with Senator Rogers um, with House, Senate Bill 359. There's also another virtual meetings bill that Representative Tony Cook is carrying. Um, it's similar, it's House Bill 1437, um, dealing with virtual meetings and situations when these can be used outside of a, a public health emergency, but also just putting into code that we can continue virtual meetings when in public health emergencies. Um, this is an item also on the governor's legislative agenda. He seems supportive of kind of the approach we're taking with um, Senator Rogers, Senate Bill 359, but we'll continue working on the specific guardrails and parameters um, with the governor's team, with um, Representative Cook and Senator Rogers, and with, based on feedback from our members. Currently in Senate Bill 359, some of the parameters include um, a quorum being physically present for these meetings to take place outside of public health emergency. Um, so for an individual to participate virtually, there still needs to be that physical meeting happening. Um, this policy can be must be adopted locally. Um, and then the individual can attend only virtually only 50% of the time, unless it's the they have a health condition or military service. Um, so again, we're going to continue to work through the nuts and bolts of the specific language, but um, we'll continue to see Senate Bill 359 and House Bill 1437 moving forward as the vehicles. Thanks, Jenna. Um, if you uh, this, if you're new to AIM or new to these legislative summaries, um, you'll soon learn that there are a handful of issues that you'll see us reporting on a lot because they come up a lot in the Indiana General Assembly annexation being one, and you'll see that in the written summary today. Uh, TIF being another one of those topics that we talk about often because they're often debated in the General Assembly. Uh, we thought this year might be a year where uh, we don't have a lot to report on TIF. We had heard that uh, there may not be much uh, discussed at the State House on TIF this session, but that's turning out to maybe not be the case. Lindsay, what's out there? At least what are they talking about in terms of TIF? Yeah, there's a few different proposals that are floating around out there. Um, some are good. Um, some have some provisions that historically um, have been very problematic um, for cities and towns um, and some kind of new ideas as well that have really emerged in the last, I would say, two um, or three years. One that we have been talking about for a long time um, is whether there should be a voting school board member on redevelopment commissions. This is something that um, for you know at least five years, this has been a concept that various school groups have really supported and tried to move forward at the state house. Um, there is a proposal that's on the table this year that would require a mayor uh, or a town council president to appoint um, as one of their three appointments to the RDC, a voting school board member. There's also um, some financial pieces to bills that are on the table right now, one of which would require RDCs to um, send TIF revenue to the overlapping taxing units automatically. So uh, for example, in year one, you would have to send 5% of your revenue to the overlapping taxing units up to a maximum of 30% over a six year period. Um, that applies to um, new TIF areas, but also in existing TIF areas too. It creates this revenue sharing arrangement for <clears throat> TIF revenue. Uh, there's a couple of other proposals floating around out there. Um, one would allow a school corporation to choose whether to participate in a TIF and a new TIF area. So if that school corporation did not want to participate um, as the increment grows in a TIF area, the portion of that which would flow to the school corporation, um, or I'm sorry, would be captured by the um, TIF area would still flow to the school corporation. So that would continue to be passed through and not captured um, by the TIF. 
Um, a couple of other ideas. Um, one would change how TIF money can be spent outside of a TIF area um, or a TIF district and um, some changes too to how TIF can be used for workforce training programs and scholarship programs and those sorts of arrangements that some communities have made with schools. So there are several proposals floating around out there now and definitely more to come on that. All right, thanks Lizzie. And another issue that does seem to come up um, a lot in recent years is broadband, access to broadband. And that um, the, the access issue is something that's been really highlighted be, because everyone is doing so much virtual learning, virtual meetings due to the pandemic. Um, so we're excited to see that the governor has um, a proposal on that as part of his legislative package. Matt, do you wanna talk about that? Yeah, sure. Um, the, you said it perfectly. We we are excited to see the governor's proposal. We'll be uh, supporting that as, as much as we absolutely can. Uh, it should come as no surprise, I think, to anybody listening that broadband access during the pandemic has received an awful lot of attention, deservedly so, whether it's telehealth or school needs or, or whatnot. Um, you know, it's often viewed, I think, by municipal leaders as a a utility service that the city or the town may not necessarily provide, but one that is critically necessary to new home construction, to new business development, a whole variety of things. So we continue to be very much engaged in, in the process and uh, deployment of more broadband, particularly in more rural parts of, of Indiana. Uh, but it should not go unnoticed that there are pockets of very urban areas that are lacking in uh, high speed uh, access as well. Uh, so we're, on the surface, very supportive of the efforts uh, to bring expanded broadband to the state. I think the, the balance will be uh, striking that right balance between right-of-way access, fees, and the need for additional uh, and expanded service. So uh, we'll monitor this as the session goes along, but uh, suffice it to say, we're encouraged by where things are heading and look forward to, to participating and updating you further as session goes along. All right, thanks. All right, guys, I think that's a wrap on week two. Um, be sure to watch your email frequently next week. It'll be a busy committee week. Um, there may be additional updates coming from the legislative team, but for sure we'll be back next Friday. Thanks.